Hello, and welcome to My Counselor Live. My name is Brittany East, and today we are covering one of the more sensitive topics that comes up during marital counseling, which is infidelity recovery. To help us walk through one of the most important aspects of this recovery process is licensed family and marriage therapist, Tara Riggs. Tara, before we jump into this sensitive topic, do you mind sharing a little bit about yourself for those who may not know you yet? Sure, sure. So yeah, as uh, Brittany said, my name is Tara. Um, I am located in the panhandle of Florida. And uh, I've been with my counselor online for about two years now. I'm one of our clinical supervisors on the team. Mm -hmm. And um, really, kind of my niche, what I love to do is couples work, all things couples mm -hmm. work, specifically working with, uh, work, walking with couples through infidelity recovery. Uh, it's a really important part of what we do, a really restorative process. Um, mm -hmm. And also really, as you said, so important and such a sensitive topic. Well, Tara, I'm really grateful for the work you do. And I really appreciate even just reading your article. And I'm sure our audience is going to get that feel that you really, just, you have um, a lot of empathy and you just want to create an area with no shame also around feelings and things like that um, for the person who's been affected. So really right. appreciate that. Really uh, grateful to jump into this topic with you. So your article title today is how to write an impact letter for infidelity recovery. So what inspired you to write this article? Yeah, so this was kind of an extension of our current um, infidelity recovery process. So we had, uh, we have had for quite some time, we've had uh, the betraying spouse writing the disclosure letter okay. um, to their spouse, to the what we call the betrayed spouse. And so this was an opportunity. This is something that we just really felt there was a need for, which is how do they respond to that? Can they mm -hmm. respond in the same way that this was, you know, in that form of a letter where they're able to kind of articulate their thoughts and sit down with all of these kind of crazy, raging, chaotic, overwhelming feelings inside of them and try to organize it and put it into words and put it on paper and so that their voice can be heard because they're the ones, right, that their pain needs to be honored. And so this was um, really, uh, this kind of came out of a place of need in our, in our recovery work um, to give the betrayed spouse a voice in this process. That's amazing. And so when you wrote this article, was it just for the betrayed spouse to read or who do you think would benefit from reading it then? Yeah, so this is it's specifically written for the betrayed spouse. Now, the betraying spouse is welcome to read it. Anyone who's walking through infidelity recovery or knows someone who is walking through infidelity recovery, I think would benefit from it. But it's very specifically written to the betrayed spouse um, because it's, it's really, like I said, it's helping them to organize their thoughts and their kind of internal world into words in order to be able to communicate it to their spouse. That makes sense. So you called it an impact letter. Can you explain more of like what that is or even like why it's important to have an impact letter? Sure, sure. Um, so the the impact letter to really gets the idea is that this this thing that you have done has impacted me deeply. There's there is nothing really more disorienting and disorganizing into our in our internal world than infidelity. There because it's like we we stand at the altar and we pledge our life to someone and we think that this is going to be for death to us part and forsaking all others and we make these commitments and vows to one another and then one then our partner goes outside of that and they chose someone else over us right? Or they, um, they kind of flirted with lines or they, whether it's, you know, they used pornography or they got into an emotional relationship or a physical sexual relationship. And, and it just kind of has this ability to like fray the fabric of who we are because we see ourselves as one, right? God has said that let two become one. And so we have united ourselves with this person, believing that our life is going to be built on the foundation of this relationship going forward. And so when infidelity comes into a relationship, it completely is disorienting to all of that, the way that I view myself as kind of, you know, the other, my person's other half, right? Now it's like, who am I? What am I doing here? So it's so disorienting to the person. And so this is, um, this is, it, this is really necessary. This impact letter is so necessary to talk, to be able to give that space 
to be able to say, I've been impacted deeply, not just on the surface, right? Like you didn't just go outside of our relationship, but this impacts who I am and the way that I think about myself and the way that I think about the world and other people and the way I think about God. And so we're giving, we're creating a lot of space and a lot of structure around um, being able to take this really disorganized, disoriented, kind of chaotic view of myself that has happened as a result of my partner's affair. And we, we try to help them to organize it. And it's as much for the betrayed spouse to be able to try to in, you know, organize their internal world and all of that disruption that's happened as a result of infidelity. And it's also for the betraying spouse to hear and to understand just how deep their partner has been wounded by their actions. Yeah, it definitely, reading your article, I could definitely, like, if I could feel like that pain and even just the poignancy of like pointing out kind of like, you're right, like everything is really, everything's impacted. It's not just, oh, my marriage was just impacted. Like it kind of touches so many parts of our life, especially even our relationship with God and worldview and view of ourselves, all these things. So it sounds just like a really overwhelming process to write this letter. Do you mind, like, is there a, like a process to like doing that? Is there different steps we should like go through if we need to like write a letter like this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, and we, um, I liken it as a Floridian, I liken it to what it's like to go through a hurricane, right? So a hurricane and as Floridians, you know, I kind of use a little bit of that analogy in the, in the, um, in the article, because you know, this first step, so the step one is what we call inventorying the impact. And that's just kind of what I think of Bella as like the bird's eye view, high level, I'm looking at all of the damage being done. And I'm kind of like taking like a survey of the full range of the pain, a full range of the damage, right? And I kind of liken that to when there's a hurricane, like, and we're seeing it all over the news, right? You're seeing the destruction, you're seeing the devastation, right? And you're seeing, you get these like helicopter kind of overhead views of all of the destruction. And you're just like, oh, and just, just devastated by how much has been impacted. And that's really this first step is inventorying the impact, just kind of taking a survey of all of the areas that have been touched in life. And then in the second step, we go to examine the damage. And so that's what I kind of liken to, like, sometimes you don't even have power. You don't even have power to turn on the news mm -hmm. to see where the damage is. All I have to do is walk out my front door. And when I walk outside my front door, there's power lines down and there's, you know, trees in the road and there's, you know, um, just it's everywhere. There's just debris everywhere. And it's that same idea of now we're going to we're like feet are on the ground. We're no longer at that bird's eye view. And we are really looking at uh, what has been impacted. And this, this is really the more the, the how I've been impacted, if that makes sense. Okay. So step one was more like the what of what's been impacted. Step two in examining the damage is really, you know, how I've been impacted by this. Um, and really kind of talking through each of those areas. So in the letter, um, in, the, in the article, I talk about in step one, I go through all of these different possibilities of areas that have been touched, right? So everything from, you know, example would be like, you know, my trust, my emotional and mental health, my self-worth, my spirituality, my children, my work, my family, my friendships, sexuality, vulnerability, my story. And so that's kind of all in step one. And so in step two, when we examine the damage, we go in depth, we kind of take a dive into each one of those. And we go into how have those been those things been impacted uh, by the infidelity. And so there's and so we kind of really develop that. And then in the third step, which I think is can be one of the hardest parts. Um, the third step is to give our emotions a voice. And the reason why I say this is the hardest part is because um, infidelity is relational trauma, right? This is relational trauma. And what happens when we're traumatized is we have this tendency, our brain, because it's protective and it's adaptive and it knows what to do and how to protect us, it dissociates. And so oftentimes what happens is I will unintentionally, kind of unconsciously like bubble wrap all of my feelings Right. And it's like, I can't even, I can't even touch that. I have to stay in my head. I have to think through what my next step is. Right. But then because we avoid them, they tend to kind of blow up. Right. So we have these really big, like emotional dysregulation kind of eruption that happens. And so we like, and then we suppress it again and then it disrupts and then it erupts again and we suppress it again. So 
what we do in step three is really um, allowing ourselves to really feel into the pain, right? Not in a way that's like overwhelming, but in a way that wraps words around what I'm feeling about all of this, right? So like, I'm actually going to put words to my pain and that is a hard thing to do, yeah. right? And so I liken this, you know, in that hurricane metaphor to what happens inside my house, right? What happens when the tree goes through my window yeah. or comes over my roof, right? And, you know, the, the roof is pulled off of my house. It's that deep devastation, this place where I thought I was safe, this place where I thought I was known. And instead, what I get is fear, right? I get fear and I get sadness and I have anger and we allow, you know, we really welcome and invite the betrayed spouse to wrap language around what they're going through in step three. And it's, this is a hard process. I, I tell my, I tell the clients in this is feel free to walk away and come back to this as many times as you need to. This is not a one and done kind of process. This is a deeply emotional process. And then step four is what I call, is kind of what I, I, I liken it to like making your insurance claim, right? Which is like, how am I going to recoup everything I've lost? And that is step four is owning your needs, right? So now you have a chance to ask for what you need from your spouse, right? If that is, you know, daily moments of connection, daily touch points, if you need, um, if you need, you know, really anything that you, anything that you need kind of on that, like emotional level, um, then that's where, this is the place where you get to ask for that, right? This is where you get, you kind of, you are invited and you are, uh, we encourage our clients to really ask for whatever they need on that emotional, mental, relational level. Um, we have something separate called the transparency plan which is, that is, that's a separate piece of this infidelity recovery process where, you know, they talk about, you know, one of the needs oftentimes is for transparency. They need right. their spouse to, to be honest and transparent with them. And so we have a whole separate article on transparency planning and kind of where we need to, what we need to look at and where we need to be a transparent and what that looks like. Um, so this is, so that's a little bit separate. So I just wanted to make mention of that because you, yeah. yes, you definitely need transparency, but that's a whole, that's kind of, we kind of make that a separate thing here. And so this step we're really talking about is the emotional and mental kind of needs that you have with your, and relational needs you have from your spouse. And then the fifth step is to put it all together. So we put steps one through four all together in a letter. Um, and you will sit down in a session uh, with your therapist and with your betraying spouse and you honor your voice and you honor the wounds and the pain and you speak all of it to them and it's such an important process do you feel like it's for people who have been betrayed I mean, it sounds like this is a really intense emotional process like kind of you have that you can go to it come back like do you mm -hmm. typically put a time frame for like when to have this done or is it really just on the betrayed spouses like just when they feel like they're ready to start writing that yeah so we it is it kind of follows we kind of follow a process or what we what we call a protocol within a fair recovery which is that there is the disclosure letter first and then there's the transparency plan and then comes the impact letter mm -hmm. and so that's kind of that's there's a there's a kind of a method there in terms of why we want to do it that way um and so this is, that's kind of, this is kind of the third big uh, benchmark, if you will, um, in the recovery process. Um, and, and so that is, and it's important now in terms of how long it takes a person to write the letter, like as a therapist, I'm going to be meeting with them to kind of, to be supporting them through this process because it is such an emotional, emotionally laden process. So I'm going to be meeting with them individually to kind of help them to write it, to help support them as they're walking through all of the emotions that are coming up as they're walking, as they are writing the letter. Um, and then where you typically will book like a double session um, in order for the spouse so for the person to be able to read their impact letter to the betraying spouse and really get to kind of unpack all of that. Um, and so yeah, it's, a, it's definitely an intense process. And we kind of go at the rate that the client needs us to, you know, as slow as we need to. That's awesome. So yeah. I really liked in your article, you said that the brain processes emotional pain the same way it processes 
physical pain. And I really liked when kind of going back to you, because we're talking through all these steps and just right. that one, I think it's step three, or maybe step four about like naming, like putting the, uh, naming the emotions that's kind of going through right. it. Step and three. it just seemed like, and I appreciated you saying that because I kind of gave like freedom, like you know, if you're going through like physical trauma or physical pain, like you would have to address it. <laughs> you can't just right. like, like, right. oh, my arm's broken. I'm just going to ignore it and hope right. that we'll right. get better. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard. It's kind of hard to hear. I mean, even reading it, you know, mm -hmm. thinking about other emotional trauma, like I've been, it's like, oh, I forget. Yeah. Like you have to really mm -hmm. face those emotions right. to like heal from them. Right. Um, that's one of the big right. things I got from your article and why this impact letter is so important is besides like narrating it for the betraying spouse is really just for your own self to like to heal is right. what it seems like right. right absolutely and i would say that that is that's kind of the entire affair recovery process in counseling is helping you helping the betrayed spouse to feel their emotions and to feel the support of the therapist as they're feeling their way into their trauma. And really, you know, Brittany, as you're saying that, I'm thinking, goodness, this letter could be applied to a multitude of traumas, right? Anytime you've gone through emotional trauma, you know, I hadn't even thought about it that way, but you're right. It's like, it's so important. You know, we go through hard things and especially I think in Western culture and in American culture, I think that we are really quick to just be like, got to get over it, got to pull ourselves up by our bootstrap and just push through. And that is not how the brain works. That's not how healing works. And so we really do have to allow ourselves to, to feel our way through these emotions, through the pain, we have to honor our pain mm -hmm. and allow someone to care for us, right? That is the body of Christ. Like that is what we are meant to do. We are not meant to be an island. We're not meant to be alone. And so it's so important um, that we can, we feel more resourced and we feel more supported to face our pain when there's somebody there alongside us. And that's my job as a therapist. And it's honestly what I love and what is an honor and a privilege to do. Yeah, I can definitely tell that like talking with you that you really do feel honored to help couples with this. So yeah, sure. is there any final piece of advice for anyone watching this, for the couples that are watching this that you would give them as they're maybe facing this daunting um, part of their marriage? Yeah, I guess I think that the, the only piece of advice that really comes to mind is, um, I think that the kind of the cry of my heart right now is like, I guess I kind of want to say to whoever's watching, like, uh -huh. let us help you. Like, let us help mm -hmm. you. So often it's such a shameful process for both parties whenever we're going through infidelity, right? And it's like, you are not alone. You don't have to face this alone. Like, let us support you and love you through this process. Um, you don't you know, as you just mentioned, right? You can ignore the pain of your broken arm, but what's gonna happen? It's just gonna heal in a way that's faulty and it's never gonna work the same again, right? It has to be reset and that's our job, right? Our job is to help you heal properly, right? And restore what has been broken. No, I really appreciate that. Thank you, Kara. It's really, um, I know it's a heavy topic and you just really have a way of like walking through that. So we're actually transitioning to the next part of our episode, which is our trending topic. Mm -hmm. um, very different, what we are just talking about, but actually I guess what people are curious about these days is agoraphobia. So mm -hmm. can you just kind of explain just in a broad sense, what is agoraphobia? Yeah, so agoraphobia is essentially, it's a phobia, right? So it's an anxiety or a fear around, um, it's, not, it's not exactly like leaving your home, but it's basically just a fear of large spaces or large crowds. Oh, okay. It can be, um, so it's not, it's, it can be everything from crowded places to enclosed places to um, large expansive places. It's just basically this idea that fear kind of begins to overtake you. It oftentimes happens comorbidly with panic attacks, but essentially a person has a panic attack and then uh, they're kind of, uh, and the kind of the definition of a panic attack is like the fear of fear, right? It's the, it's the being afraid of their own fear and being overtaken by that. And when that happens once, it can make you kind of afraid to do anything to trigger it again. And so essentially there's this idea that like home is safe 
Mm -hmm. And it's one of the only places that I can really feel safe. And so when it gets really extreme, people become almost like just completely homebound um, and will be afraid to do anything. And it's interesting that this topic is trending right now because I'm thinking about the way that this relates to COVID, right? We've all been home. We've all felt safe at home, right? That's what everyone's been telling us. That's what media tells us. That's what everybody tells us, (laughs) right? You know, stay home. That's where you're safe, you know, and anywhere else (laughs) So you can, you know, catch this deadly virus, right? And so it makes a lot of sense that this is a topic that like, man, how has that, what have we internalized in the last two years that we've been going through this mm, pandemic? Yeah. Right? That we believe that out there is not safe. It just breaks my heart. It breaks my heart that this is even a trending topic right now. It makes a lot of sense, but I just think, oh, Lord, we just need just to restore a sense of safety to our bodies. No, I really appreciate that. I feel like that restoration process is just so important. So yeah. if someone's trying to like, they're not sure they might have agoraphobia or not, what are the symptoms to kind of look out for? I mean, besides not wanting to leave your home, although I'll be honest, mm-hmm. sometimes I don't want to leave my home and it's just because yeah. it's just comfortable. But yeah, what yeah. are some of the symptoms to like look for in yourself? Sure. Yeah. You bring up a great point. Like what's the difference between this, and, like just being a homebody? Like I just love <laughs> it. Like I don't like going out in big crowded places and I don't have that much patience. And you know, <laughs> just like what, you know, that's a very different kind of thing than agoraphobia. So yeah, you make a good point there. But um, I would say that, you know, if you are noticing like, you know, things like heart palpitation. So basically just anxiety in your body, like big anxiety in your body. So what that's going to feel like is your heart is kind of beating out of your chest, right? your, your palms are sweaty, um, that you're noticing your thoughts are racing, specifically racing about being in danger or something bad happening due to the place that you are or the crowds that you're in. Um, and so, and, and really also an avoidance an avoidance of going to those places. So like, I don't want to leave home alone. If you don't want to leave home by yourself or you can't go to, you know, the grocery store without someone coming with you, like that's going to be a sign that this agoraphobia might be, you know, this might be applicable to you. Um, yeah. So it's really going to be those kind of the, the way that fear and anxiety registers in the body. You're going to be feeling a lot of that and specifically about physical places okay. is really kind of like attachment. Yeah. No, that makes a lot more sense. So what can someone do if they have agoraphobia? Like what are the treatment options they can even like to help get them back out in the world? Sure. Sure. So what's happening. Um, and to answer that question, I'll tell you a little bit about kind of what's happening in the brain is that you have this, you have a smoke detector in your brain that's called the amygdala and it's constantly scanning your environment for a threat. And this has been, you know, this has been in terms of, you know, our evolution and survival as a species has been clutch for us, right? Because if we can find danger in the environment, then we can avoid it. And so this, the idea is that um, we are, your brain, your amygdala is registering a threat in the environment. And, but there is not an actual threat, right? It's a, what we call a perceived threat. Right. And so what we have to do is we have to help you to feel safe in your own body. And we have to turn off that amygdala response, that smoke detector. Right. And the way that we do that is we can do that through uh, breathing techniques and relaxation. We can do that through just like kind of mindful meditation exercise. Um, We're going to do that through in at MCO, we use something called um, accelerated experiential psychodynamic therapy, AEDP. And, um, and so what we do using AEDP is we will use the imagination to work healing. And so what that can mean is, can you imagine being in that place, right? And then we're as a, in, in my imagination, I'm in that place, but my body is physically in the session with my therapist. Okay. And so I'm working to calm the physical body, right? Physiologically bring calm to the body while also imagining this kind of scary place. And it's helping to kind of reteach and retrain my nervous system that it's safe in those kinds of spaces. Um, And so that's what I would do kind of as a therapist is to kind of work to relax the body and specifically when it's triggered and for with working with the places that it gets triggered. No, that sounds amazing that we can eat that this new therapy, I don't know how new it is, but the therapy can be used to like, Mm -hmm. you said, like just really start giving people tools to kind of process what would happen if they're faced with like these fears. So very neat. Thank you for bringing that like knowledge and everything to like this trending topic. And you talked about like COVID has brought out another side of people, like a lot of mental health issues that 
when people just didn't even realize we're there to begin with. So true. Yeah. This is wild. Well, our last part of our show today is our viewer Q and A. This is one of my favorite times because these are viewer submitted questions. So, and they're always answered anonymously. So these can't be traced back to the person who asked them or anything, but we do wanna answer it in a way that's really helpful, not just for the person who asked it, but for all of you who are listening um, to really glean, you know, what kind of questions can be asked in therapy and really, I mean, one, you can ask any question. <laughs> There's no off bounds, but to just give you a sense of like what we can offer. And so, if you want to ask your own question, you can go to mycounselor.online slash ask and all the questions will be added into um, future episodes so we can help you out. So Tara, our first question today, and these both, both our questions actually are um, within the realm of marriage. So it kind of goes in with our article topic. Mm -hmm. It says, my husband and I are Christians. We have a lot of marital issues, but a major issue is he wants anal sex and I don't. Is that wrong of me? Hmm. Well, goodness, I just can hear, um, I hear such a sense of guilt around your boundaries, right? And I think that I want to speak to a couple of different things that I'm hearing in that question. And one is that um, we have to be, we have to respect one another's boundaries in marriage, right? That we cannot, I cannot impose or force what I want onto my spouse without their willingness, right? That's what we call abuse. And so we, you know, obviously that's not the intention here, um, but this is really, um, this is something where we have to be honoring of one another, right? If to honor our husband or to honor our wife means to respect their boundaries. And so, no, is it wrong of you to not want this? You know, no, absolutely not. I will also say that we really can't separate sex from all of those other marital issues that, she, that, that this person is implying right? That my ability to have fun and play in sex is directly related to how connected and intimate and vulnerable I can feel with my husband or my wife, right? Mm -hmm. And so this, right, we can't, we can't separate those two. They're kind of mirror images of one another. And so I would say like those marital issues are affecting like how free you feel to explore in your sexuality, and so those things definitely go together. Um, and so I would say like, don't, don't wait. You know, one of the things I, I write in another article that I have coming out shortly is that, um, you know, the average couple waits six years are in distress for six years before coming to marriage therapy. And by that point, you know, sometimes people are past their breaking point and they're kind of just doing lip service by coming to therapy. So like, don't wait. And I guess that's really the thing that I want to say about that is like, Hey, get some help. Even if it's not like, it doesn't have to be the end of the world. And like the, you know, the end of the relationship, for you to seek therapy, you know, come in preventatively, come in while things are, you know, while things are not terrible, you know, before, before you dislike your partner, right? While you still like each other, come in and we can just help strengthen that. No, I really appreciate that. I'm just curious. I know this wasn't part of the submit interview question, but if someone, you know, maybe you're married and you feel like you want to start going to therapy um, to start getting help, but your spouse doesn't, does that happen ever within therapy or how do, would you handle that then? Yeah, that's a, it's tough. I mean, I think that we can, we can do a lot of work individually. I think we can do a lot of, oftentimes what we find is what happens in marriage is that the, the wounds of our childhood get projected onto our spouse Mm. and that and the and our spouse bumps up against these unhealed wounds what okay. sue johnson who was the you know founder of eft says uh these are called raw spots and so what happens is our this is there's this unhealed wound that we brought into the marriage with us and our spouse keeps bumping up against it right mm -hmm. so there's a lot that i can do individually with just one party to heal that original wound that's going to help it help you to be not so reactive and responsive mm -hmm. to what your spouse is doing um, but that's, that's still kind of half of the equation, right? The best I can do is 50%, right? In that situation, right? So that kind of puts a bit of a cap on, you know, how much we can really create change. But we do know that when you create change in one part of a system, it creates change in the whole system, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, so yeah, I would say like that is, that's definitely a dynamic where it's, you know, one partner is just not willing to come. Um, and you can't make them again, kind of going back to this idea of boundaries, right? Like yeah. you have to respect their boundary that they don't want to do that yet. 
Um, and some people, unfortunately, have a really high threshold for suffering. And they suffer for a long time before they ever get help. And I would just kind of implore people to just like, you know, like lower that threshold. You're not meant to be self-sufficient. There's no shame in coming, you know, mm -hmm. and like, let yourself be helped, let yourself be healed. Um, there is no shame in that, right? Like you are, we are restoring, we are working to restore God's design for your life. Yeah, that's beautiful. So our second question is um, also relates to so this our, the bedroom. So it says, how can my spouse and I rekindle our sex life? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a great question and so broad that it's a little bit difficult for me to answer because without knowing more information, right? I'm like, is it because of age? Is it because of relational issues and blocks in the relationship? Is it because one person has higher desire and one person has lower desire? You know, with each of those situations, I would handle it differently. Okay. So it's a little bit difficult to answer that question without knowing more, but I would definitely just, I guess more than anything, what I want to say is like, it can, you absolutely can rekindle your sex life. I'm just not sure how to speak to that exactly um, without knowing what's getting in the way. Nope, that makes total sense. Mm -hmm. Well, Tara, I really appreciate you like coming here and just really sharing your wisdom, really sharing your heart um, with everyone today and just really giving some really practical tools I feel for people who are going through, um, who maybe experience an affair, going through that infidelity recovery process. So. Thank you so much for bringing light um, to that topic because I definitely feel like there's a lot of topics that Christians can feel like are allowed to be talked about or should be swept under the rug. And but I really appreciate um, not just about MCO, but just you know in therapy, just that it re you really bring a lot of things to light and just realize how much God even really just wants things to be restored. Right. Like that's really His heart, and it, clearly it's very your heart as well. And not to like live in shame and live in guilt but, and live in pain, you know, mm -hmm. but really to live in healing and restoring. So thank you yeah. so much for doing that today. Um, yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. And for everyone um, who submitted questions, thank you. Don't forget to, if you want to, if you want to submit your own question to go to mycounselor.online slash ask. We really love hearing from you and love hearing about the topics that you are curious about. If you're not already subscribed to our social media channels, you can find us on Facebook when you search Love My Counselor. On Instagram, you can search the same thing. Our handle is Love My Counselor. And on YouTube, you can search My Counselor Online Christian Counseling. Thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you next week for another episode of My Counselor Live. Mm -hmm.